Welcome back to Radical Health Radio, you beautiful health seeker. Today, we're talking all about stress. This is the stress pod. I'll tell you what I mean when I say what happens in the Vegas stays in the Vegas. I'll talk about what stress is, how stress is perceived in the body, how it can limit us from getting our most radical, healthy self actualized, why stress can keep you stuck and make you sick and fat, and of course, some tangible tools on how to manage stress, how to perceive it differently, and how to regulate it so we can get the results that we really deserve and want from this health journey. Let's get into the show. Hello friends, welcome back. Today we're talking all about stress. Stress is what I call the silent progress killer because it's not always objectively outwardly obvious, but we all feel it. I think there is no person walking the face of the earth right now that doesn't feel some baseline level of stress. And we were looking before we hit record today about some statistics we could share with you about the rising prevalence of self-reported stress. And numbers range anywhere from 60 to 75% increases in the last 15 years or so. This seems to be particularly pronounced in people under the age of 50 and in this cohort of like 18 to 30 young adults, as we'd call them. Now, I guess there's a couple of things going on there. It's more okay, I guess, to speak about this thing, to put your hands up and admit like, hey, I'm suffering from stress or anxiety or depression or some stress-related disorder. And maybe some of the older heads amongst us are just a little bit more, you know, resilient or stoic or uh, ashamed sometimes to say like, hey, I feel stress right now, you know, because it maybe can be perceived sometimes as a sign of weakness. Again, I think when we vulnerably express sometimes that I'm feeling a little bit stressed, I need help, I need to consume material that's uplifting in this way, but that's actually a source of strength. But I wanted to dive into stress with you today to kind of give you a broad overview of of like what it is, how it's processed in the body and how it is the progress killer because you can be doing a lot of things really well And if you're not getting the kind of results or the kind of quality of mind that you want, there's probably an issue with stress under the hood. So what does stress do? What is it? What does it do in our body? How it can keep us stuck, sick and fat and what we can do to manage stress and surf the waves of stress a little bit better in our lives. So defining stress is simply put, it's the body's reaction to a change in its environment. So your body is a complex milieu of cells that is constantly responding to external events and sometimes internal events. This is this very interesting feedback loop that something happens out there, the body responds, but then we also tag onto this, the mind, the way we think about things. And that can create a feedback loop because if we think about something as being very negative and our anxiety starts to go up and our mental chatter starts to go up, that actually informs our physiology too. So we get a little more increase in adrenaline, a little more increase in cortisol, and it becomes a self-perpetuating loop. So your body's constantly responding to its environment and all stress is ran through the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic meaning it's automatic. This is the trick. Learning to control this a little bit more is tricky because in a sense, you're fighting your hard wiring. You're fighting your natural tendencies. I've said before on the podcast, but I love framing it in this way because it just helps you take some power back and understand that work needs to be done here. That the beautiful burden of having a brain is that it's designed to help you survive, not to help you thrive. And if you want to thrive, you've kind of got to go against your instincts sometimes in a sense of not being so quick to jump on negative information because negativity is sticky, like very Velcro-like. You see this too. The algorithms play on this. The news plays on this. If it bleeds, it leads. You will give way more attention and focus to potentially threatening slash negative information or news or events than you will to positive, unfortunately. This is our inherent negativity bias. And it's because... For the vast majority of our evolution, survival is the name of the game. And we've survived in times of hardship. We've survived in times of scarcity. But now we live in times of abundance. Abundance in the sense of information, lots of which is negative. Uh, Things that can distract us, things that can pull us away. So all of these inputs in this complex milieu of cells and this autonomic nervous system is constantly 
responding and adapting to your environment. And it's run through the autonomic nervous system in two branches, predominantly the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is the one we'll, you know, kind of talk about from the fight or flight perspective. So there's not really much sympathetic about the sympathetic nervous system. It's the go, 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 the do, 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 the adrenaline, the cortisol, the rah, rah. That's the sympathetic nervous system. It's the classic stress response this is the, the the version of the nervous system that's running where the heart rate's going to increase, the adrenaline's going to increase, the cortisol is going to increase. It's the survival mode. Everything in the sympathetic nervous system is getting you ready to flee or fight. And the issue is we live in that mode so much, but then we stay still, right? We, we feel stressed and anxious on our phones, but then we stay still in our couch. So we've also got this evolutionary mismatch, this biological, physiological, mental, emotional mismatch where we live so much in this dominant sympathetic nervous system and then we don't move, we don't shake it off, we don't express it and it leads to things like burnout, it leads to things like hypercortisolemia, which we'll get into. And a big point that I want you to think about when we frame these two nervous systems is that predominantly the sympathetic nervous system is catabolic and catabolic means it breaks things down. So if you're constantly in a stress state, you're constantly breaking down. You're literally breaking down your body. We'll explain why soon, but you are breaking down. It's a catabolic process. So the parasympathetic is very different to that. This is the break. This is the rest and digest. It's the stay and play. It's the assimilation. It's a little bit more flowy. Your heart rate comes down. Your cortisol decreases. Your muscles relax, your endothelial cell layers relax, so your blood pressure comes down. This is where digestion and assimilation is improved. And it's anabolic. So if we think about it, catabolic is destructive, anabolic is growth promoting because a lot of the parasympathetic activities are recovery. So a classic and interesting example here is weight training. When you lift weights in the gym, the actual act of lifting the weights is destructive. It's a stress response. It, it breaks down the muscles. It's catabolic. It's actually the anabolic recovery window of the parasympathetic behaviors like eating well and sleeping well and managing stress and hydration that is the catabolic element of that. The stimulus from the stress response signal the breakdown. That was all of the effort. The response now to grow, the anabolic window, is actually a parasympathetic one. And we need a balance. And I think the big thing that I'm noticing amongst myself and pretty much everybody that's walking around on the face of the earth right now is we don't spend enough time in stay and play land. We don't spend enough time in rest and digest. We don't spend enough time over here being anabolic and growth promoting, pulling things back in and just kind of being like, oh, okay. Yeah. Life's, life's good. It's very much like go, go, go. Life is crazy. Oh my God, the world's going to collapse. L I've got 101 things to do on my to-do list today and everything is ran through that branch of the nervous system. And what happens in the Vegas stays in the Vegas. Not Vegas out there on the strip in the casinos, the Vegas nerve, which is this mediator of getting you from the sympathetic into the parasympathetic. And we can stimulate the Vegas nerve and move ourselves very consciously from sympathetic to parasympathetic using some of the tools that we'll discuss today. So all hope is not lost, friend. The the one thing that I want to really touch on today is this analogy. It's not scientific, it's none of those things, but it really helps to conceptualize and understand all of the stress inputs that's coming in and give you something practical that you can hold on to to think about and, and relieve some stress in your life. So I call it the stress bucket. And I, I want you to literally pull up the image of a bucket in your mind right now. And because all stress, that we can compartmentalize stress. We can say, okay, well, that's that stress and this is relationship and this is my work and this is my exercise and this is my lack of sleep. But in the body, everything's processed through the autonomic nervous system. So let's see the autonomic nervous system for a minute as a bucket. And you've got every single input of stress in your life going into this bucket. And if you've ever played with a bucket at the beach or you've tried to fill it with sand or water, you know that all buckets have a finite capacity. Once it's full, things start to spill over the edges. Your bucket is full. 
And I think that a lot of people's stress bucket is overflowing. And this is where we see the problems occur. This is where we see breakdowns in extreme cases. This is where we see, you know, the, the lingering effects of oxidative stress. This is where we see mental disorders. This is where we'll see anxiety and depression start to manifest. It's when our stress buckets are overflowing because all of these inputs are going in and nothing's coming out. We're not pulling out the, the, the spade and paling the bucket. We're not punching a little hole in the butter, putting a tap in there and opening up and releasing what's going into the bucket. But we can if we're more intentional about this. So if you've got an asymmetry between the sheer amount of stress coming in and not enough going out, eventually the wheels are going to fall off. Eventually you're going to start to overflow. And when you do, it's not an overflow of abundance. It's an overflow of disaster. Essentially, anybody that's operating from that hyper stress state is not present, is not grounded, and is not operating as their healthier self. So when you think about your stress bucket, all these impacts going in, your relationships, your family, your finances, your work, the asshole of a boss that's being mean to you, your lack of sleep, the traffic, the fact that the barista didn't give you raw milk in your latte, they give you bloody oat milk in your latte. Ah! What are you doing to take it out? <clears throat> what are you doing to get back into parasympathetic land? Um, this is going to lead over the long run to physically injury, a tight body. You're going to hold those things in your body. They're going to manifest in strange ways or burnout or fatigue. So we need to open the tap or we need to pull out the bucket, uh, the spade rather, and start to pail stuff out of this bucket. And this can be uh, you know, breath work, meditation, a good diet. We're going to go a little bit deeper on some of these. But the point being, you need to start to take stuff out of your stress bucket so that then you can operate from a little bit more of a resourced place. You might have heard if you've been in this self-development world for a while that you want to give from a full cup, not an empty cup. So if you have this image of the bucket here, and then maybe you have a tap at the bottom of the bucket and you're opening the tap and now it's flowing into this cup. This is your resource now. Your bucket is your autonomic nervous system. This cup is what you get to give to the world, right? And if it's empty because you're not putting anything in for you, like good food and good sleep and all of these behaviors, then you're trying to pour into the world from an empty cup. And what comes out of an empty cup? absolutely nothing and you're just trying to give 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 and all of these inputs are coming in and you're not managing them well and all of a sudden you're left with nothing and you feel like you have nothing either no energy or nothing to give or no life force and it just kind of feels crappy and i think we've all tasted that so we have to start filling our cup back up so we can give from the overflow and that often means prioritizing ourselves and prioritizing the parasympathetic nervous system and minimizing some of the chronic effects of the sympathetic nervous system but before we move forward, I do want to highlight something that often gets lost in the messaging around stress, which is not all stress is bad too. You know, everything when we talk about stress, we often think chronic stress, all bad. What do we do? But stress is needed, right? We, we, we need a certain dose of stress because stress is also the inputs, if you will, to control the outputs of how you respond. So this is the difference between you stress and distress. You stress is the appropriate dose of good stress at the right time in a regulated body that causes adaptations that are positive. Distress is too much stress that's not held in the right way that causes distress and destruction. So not all stress is bad. Some stress can be great. An example I've already talked about is resistance training. That is a good stressor at the appropriate time when the dose is right. If you go to the gym, break down your muscles, cause a stress response, but then you bounce from that catabolic window into the anabolic parasympathetic, you feed yourself well, you nutrify, you get in the adequate protein and carbohydrates to fuel that workout, you get your seven or eight hours of sleep, you also have good healthy lifestyle behaviors, you see the sun, then that is a great stressor. But we also have to always consider the stress bucket that stress summates and stress is stress is stress and sometimes even good stress can be too much stress if we're already kind of overflowing from our bucket so you can take things like other good stresses ice ice baths and the sauna and fasting from time to time these are you stress behaviors but in a system that is overworked overburdened overstressed, those things can actually become a, a very fine razor's edge that we're walking that can cause more harm than good. Fasting is a very good example. In a well-resourced res person who's got all of these lifestyle factors, you know, dialed in and they're living generally from a, you know, a, a, a place of abundance and they're not super stressed and they've, they're well slept, every now and then they can throw in a fast and have the medicinal benefits of that, the, the, the spiritual benefits of that sometimes, the control over their appetite and food and to test their discipline. 
But if you take somebody that's only sleeping five hours a night, is living off coffee, is chronically calorie restricted, is doing six exercise classes a week, is stressed in the relationship, drinks a half a bottle of wine to get to sleep every night, and now thinks, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start fasting for 20 hours a day. That is not good. It's too much stress. So you take something that could be good and you make it a negative because the dose makes the poison. So we must consider that when we're thinking about good stresses and bad stresses. A lot of the time, it's your ability to handle them. The good news about that is life is adapt or die. So you can train yourselves in this way to tolerate more stress, to hold more stress. So you can become the kind of person that can work out hard every day if you want to, but you've got such a good balance between the recovery window and what you do outside of the workout that you can handle that. If you take somebody that doesn't have those behaviors and is not well-trained and hasn't trained their capacity to handle that volume and you throw them into a workout every single day and then they don't address the things outside of the gym and these parasympathetic behaviors, that's a recipe for disaster. So there's a lot of nuance when it comes to stress, but ultimately we must understand not all stress is bad. Some stress is needed. It is the stimulus to evolve, adapt, and overcome. But we must be very, very careful because we're all walking around with a lot more stress, I think, than we realize sometimes. And even the good stuff can become too much. So it's all about well-resourcing again. Now, when we go and zoom back in on the negative effects of long-term chronic stress, we encounter something called hypercortisolemia. This is essentially a body that has been burdened by the flood of adrenaline and cortisol over the long run for a long, long time. And something that's very interesting, I heard Peter Atia say this a couple of years ago on a podcast and it really stuck out to me. He basically said cortisol, this molecule of stress, which is not, again, not a bad thing, by the way. You get a natural rise of cortisol when you wake up in the morning and it gives you alertness. This is hypercortisolemia. This is basically cortisol never leaves because you're always under stress and life is always stressful. But he said cortisol is anabolic to fat cells and catabolic to muscle cells. So again, anabolism is growth promoting. So hypercortisolemia is growth promoting to fat cells. Your fat cells are like, hell yeah, let's go cortisol. Let's bathe in this and let's double and let's magnify and let's get bigger. And it's catabolic to muscle cells. Now, if we meet with catabolic breaking down, now, if we think about what we're trying to accomplish here and how important and vital of a resource muscle is and how pro-metabolic that tissue is and how the more muscle you can have, the more energy and usually the less fat you will have and that most people watching a podcast like this want to be strong and lean and healthy and have healthy levels, then hypercortisolemia is the environment that's working very much against that. It's actually growth promoting to tissue that you don't want to be growth promoting, the fat cells, and catabolic is making it very hard for you to maintain, build, or preserve muscle. So cortisol is a very interesting molecule. And, and, and when we get into hypercortisolemia, we see all kinds of things start to flesh themselves out. We see a decrease in metabolism. Your thyroid starts to slow down. Your body starts to leach minerals. Because of this low-grade oxidative stress, your body starts to burn through its micronutrients even faster. So the, uh, the, the if you are not very, very intentional about your diet, eating an animal-based diet, taking organ supplements to buffer against that, which most people are not. I know you guys are all smart, so you're doing that, but most people aren't. They're already inadequately fueled on micronutrients. The macronutrients are all screwed. They're pretty buggered up. And then the stress, you've got the case for rampant oxidative stress and massive um, inadequacies around micronutrients. So this is gonna lead to then a brain that doesn't work quite right. You know, it's not got the fuel, it's not got the, the gusto to get after life, which can manifest then as anxiety or depression or brain fog, hypercortisolemia can lead to hypertension, chronic fatigue, sleep deprivation, trouble staying asleep, migraines, tunnel vision, you've got acid reflux, digestive issues, hostility, anger, angst at the world, hunger, chronic hunger, or a complete lack of appetite because stress does different things to different people. You might even know two people in your life. I can think of two in my personal life that when they get stressed, one is a binge eater and chronically tries to soothe with food and the other's appetite just disappears completely and they wither away. So stress is very interesting now. It affects these things because the body's role is survival and this state of hypercortisolemia is essentially giving the signal that there is constant nonstop 24 seven threat in our environments that basically is life or death. And therefore these other let's say states of abundance like 
sexual hormone health and reproduction, etc., all get put on the back burner because those are signals of abundance. Your body's not concerned with you getting to procreate life. Your body's not concerned with you getting uh, able to really digest your food well and slowly when it's essentially getting a signal from its environment that there's a saber-toothed tiger in the room with me and every moment of life is threat of, of death. So hypercortisolemia is bad news and we need to learn to regulate that vagus nerve and step more back into the parasympathetic so that we can heal. Um, so this is, this is kind of why I would frame uh, stress as the silent killer. This is often the, what's going on under the hood and it has these hidden implications for your health. And again, a reminder here is to assess when, when, when you're listening to a podcast like this, you're probably listening to a bunch of other podcasts. You're probably reading books. You're probably like deep into the world of self-development and health and you love all of this stuff. But I've seen it with myself. I've even seen it with myself where I had an unhealthy obsession with health that became a chronic stressor. Like I got so fascinated with health that I was so over the top micromanaging every single bite of food that I, that I would forego opportunities to be with my friends group because... I don't know, they were going to somewhere and I knew that place used seed oils. So then I'd sit at home all bloody miserable, missing out because I couldn't be with them because, oh, I can't eat at that place. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of nuance with something like this and a lot of balance. But I was too close to the puzzle to even see it. I needed to zoom back. I ne almost needed somebody to grab me by the scruff of the neck and, and zoom out and just check in with this stress piece because you can be a really healthy person on the surface doing all of this healthy stuff buried in your work and then buried in just the the kind of automatic do, do, do life that we have. You forget that you're a human being. You turn into this rampant human doing. And all of a sudden, you're like, well, you know, for all of this stuff that I'm doing, I, I don't really feel that great. I'm not really that content or happy. I don't feel a lot of presence in my life. Maybe this last 10 or 15 pounds just won't seem to budge despite me being a a plus student on all of the, you know, the checklists. Well, what could really be going on here is the silent undercurrent of chronic stress and hypercortisolemia. So now let's switch focus and get into solutions because I want you to basically own your stress before it owns you. We're all pretty good right now at being owned by our stress, but if we can learn to take charge, which you are in charge, then we can own our stress before it owns us. Stress isn't going anywhere. Right? This modern life that we live is inherently stressful. We're suffering the evolutionary hangover of looking for danger, and now we have ample evidence to find it. So we need to learn to kind of surf. This is an analogy I like to use when it comes to stress. You can think of stress as the waves on the ocean. And if you're out there on your surfboard and you've never surfed, and these big waves are coming in, you are just getting bopped over the head, you're getting bashed into the coral reef below, and it's a bloody miserable experience. You're like, this is terrible. And you get stuck in the rips and it's a disaster. But if you can learn to surf, and the better you get at surfing, you pick up a few small waves of stress sometimes. You're like, okay, that wasn't too bad. And then eventually you see the big one coming. The next set is going to be a huge one. And there's a little bit like, okay, well, this is going to be challenging, but I've got some skills now. I can survive. And even if I fall off the board, I'm not going to drown in the rips. I'm going to be able to find my feet. So we need to learn to surf the waves of stress. We need to learn to just get better at it by responding to it. And where that starts is with the perception of it altogether. And I think this is where a lot of people get stuck. The perception is the reality. And life occurs as we perceive it. So a lot of times what is stressful in our lives is more stressful because we believe that it's stressful. And just taking power back of your locus of control is very, very important here. I think something that gives a person a great sense of equanimity and calm and control is where they place their locus of control. Is it externally or internal? And the difference is that a person that places their locus of control externally is at the mercy of the world. They're basically saying that how I feel inside is dictated by what happens outside. The weather, what's going on at work, how kind of people to me, what's my relationships like right now. And that's a losing game in my book because the world out there rarely goes to plan. And the truth of it is you're not in control of the world out there. But when you have an external locus of control, you're giving everything out there that you have no control of, the control over you. So that's a losing game. You need to switch the locus of control to an internal one. Relinquish this desire to control the world and have it meet your needs and focus on what you actually are in control of and responsible for. 
which is your mood, your attitude, the story you get to tell about what's happening, how you perceive it, because perception is reality. You get to control your effort. These are the things that you can control on. And there's an enormous amount of power in that because then you start to become the person that understands when I don't always get what I want, maybe I'm getting what I need. And that is life 101. We all want life to be great and sunshine and rainbows and pixie dust, but it very rarely looks like that, right? It's surprises, it's full of trap doors and, and sneaky little things that kind of pictures curveballs. So reframing and taking control back and saying, all right, I didn't necessarily get what I want. It didn't go to plan, but maybe I'm getting what I need. And maybe I know that I need this because I'm getting it. So what am I going to do now? Stop blaming and complaining about that out there and victimizing myself and take the power back. Come back, internal locus of control, become the hero of this story and decide what's important now. Is it arguing with the weather? Is it arguing with reality and making sure I lose? Or is it saying, all right, well, it kind of sucks. <laughs> Wouldn't have chose it, but it is what I've chose. So let's go. I think that is a much better way of focusing on it. And that's just a perspective shift. And I think because life is how you perceive it to be and perception is reality, that that is a kind of more intangible way, I guess, of just viewing the world, but it gives you very tangible results because you start to become the person that sees you're in more control than you think you are sometimes. And that when you don't get what you want, you get what you need. And that life is not happening to you and you're the victim of it. Life is happening for you and you are the victor over it. So this is the first step in learning to surf those waves of stress is how you perceive it, taking responsibility for all of that. And then we can get into some practical tools. So once you've altered your perception of stress, now we're thinking about, okay, what do we do to actually buffer against reducing stress coming in? And when it does come in, how do we get out of sympathetic go, go, go land and into the human parasympathetic BBB land? And the number one is actually a good diet. An animal-based diet is a huge buffer against stress for reasons I've talked about. The world is constantly pulling resources from you. And if you're not putting the adequate fuel back in and you're not eating adequate amounts of nutrition, well-balanced macros, making sure you get your micronutrients by including the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet, animal proteins and organs, then you are potentially setting yourself up for failure. So you're all familiar with the animal-based framework at this point. This is key. We never really think about diet as a source of our stress, but it is. And it can either be something that's a buffer against stress or it can be a source of chronic stress. The person that's out there just eating junk food and being ruled by the hedonism is causing stress. They're causing oxidative stress. And this is informing their body, again, that even though they're acquiring fuel, it's the fuel that's robbing them of life and vitality. And a surprising thing I would add here is to eat more, not less. We live in a world when it comes to food of restriction. So it's about what I can eat and, oh, you know, I've got a you know, calorie deficit my way into this and it's less and less and less. But again, you go too far down in that hole and it's scarcity. Your body is sensing the lack of abundance and it will slow down metabolism for that. We'll run into these thyroid issues. We will literally have a harder time building muscle and having a rate of, of a metabolism that's high. So sometimes eating more is the signal for abundance and getting rid of the fear by slowly wading into these waters that more automatically means more fat gain. Or eating more automatically means that I'm going to gain weight because it's not always the case. Because when we eat more, we speed up the engine. We speed up the metabolism, especially if we signal the engine with the right information. Right? Food is information. It's codes for what your body does and how it responds. If you give it the good stuff, the stuff that it wants more than anything else to thrive on, all of your engines run hotter, literally. Your mitochondria produce more ATP. You have more energy, and that energy isn't going to go to putting fat on your body unnecessarily. It's going to go to recovery and repair. It's going to go to building muscle. It's going to go to, oh, wow, now we're in a state of abundance. Let's fix these hormonal issues. Let's give more energy to the brain. Let's fix the infertility issues that we've been dealing with. It can get kind of crazy, the benefits of eating more in the appropriate amounts. Nobody's saying go out and eat more pizza and more bags of chips and more ice cream and more Coca-Cola because those mores are going to cause less in terms of your results. But more of the animal-based framework and nutrifying yourself is a good move in my book. Sleep. 
good sleep hygiene. Sleep is probably one of the best things you've got to protect against hypocortisolemia and chronic stress. Sleep in a cold, dark room, seven to eight hours a night. If you can get more, great, enjoy it. I understand that at different phases in your life, sleep is somewhat of a luxury. You know, my parents out there, you guys just, you're gonna do your best you can and survive and know that when you get through this, it'll be all right and you'll get back to those solid nights of sleep. But if you're in a position right now where you can prioritize your sleep and you're not, because you don't have a healthy boundary around your screen behaviors at night, or you're just, you know, you're just wasting time at night instead of having a hard stop and getting into bed at 10 a.m. so you can get up early or whatever, really protect that sleep. And one of the best ways I think you can do this is start to set your alarm to get up earlier because you know that getting up early isn't difficult. Getting to bed on time is what's difficult. And if you just make a rule with yourself that, all right, I'm gonna get up at 6 a.m. and you're currently getting up at 7 a.m., you need to buy that extra hour back somewhere. And you'll probably make a few mistakes along the way where you won't change your nighttime behaviors and now you're running on six hours of sleep and now you feel like junk and you're like, okay, okay. Instead of scroll holing my way into um, you know passing out from exhaustion at midnight, I'm gonna actually put my butt in bed at 10 o'clock at night. I'm gonna turn the Wi-Fi off. I'm gonna get my room nice and cold and dark and I'm going to have a beautiful sleep and then I'm going to wake up at 6 a.m. ready to attack the day and do it and start very mindfully and all of that good stuff. Movement is a way in which you can uh, mitigate stress. The caveat, of course, is again, if you are somebody that right now feels like you're on the borderline of like burnout, chronic stress, then what kind of movement do you think you need? Do you think you would be well served by doing the most intense CrossFit wads of the day every day and, you know, going absolutely crazy and leaving yourself in bits on the floor at the end of a workout? Or do you think you might be a little bit more well served by something like a yoga class or a nice walk in the park, right? So movement means different things at different times for different people. There's nothing wrong with the crazy wad that destroys you if you're well balanced. But if you are kind of, you know, just doing that every single day and you can feel the body breaking down and because you've become addicted to that or whatever it is, you keep doing it, you, you're you potentially setting yourself up for a bigger disaster down the road, which might manifest as a physical injury or a literal, you know, breakdown, um, you know, a, a burnout, a chronic burnout. So movement is good, but the dose makes the poison. Make sure your movement makes you feel better. Your exercise should make you feel energized, not completely destroyed. Now, the act of going through it is going to be tough because a lot of exercise is, but afterwards, you want to be left with this feeling of energized and and hard work and the buzz of dopamine because you did something good and the oxytocin and the endorphins and all of that good stuff. But if you finish your workout and then you're crushed for the rest of the day and you have no energy and you just can't wait to get to bed, that's a signal that you probably are going too hard and you might need to switch the focus to something that's a little bit more regenerative. Nature, sunlight, your light diet, grounding. Nature, just by this... Uh, kind of idea of being in nature more, you take multiple boxes because you can't really be in nature without getting natural light. You can't really be in nature without being surrounded by more natural sounds and sights. Even if you live in a city, the moment you step outside, you're breathing cleaner or clean-ish or as clean as you can get in a city. You're seeing birds, you're seeing trees. Hopefully you have some grass that you can find. You can put your bare feet in the grass. Remember the episode with Clint Ober? He argues that you cannot have a state of rampant oxidation and inflammation in a body if you are grounded. So this is a huge recovery tool and it's so good for the nervous system. This is one of the things that they've, they, they've measured with grounding is as soon as you put your bare feet on the grass or like I'm doing right now with my feet on a grounding mat, as soon as you do that, your body is receiving feedback and information from the earth, which is inherently more relaxing than just the hyper kind of electrified EMF soup environments that we live in right now. The natural light, so you get a healthy circadian rhythm. It buffers against the blue light that we stir at so much during the day. So always seek nature. Try and be in the water if you can. Try and go for a walk. Stillness time, some kind of introspective practice some kind of, whether it's meditation or journaling or whether it's stillness to read a book or whether it's stillness to just sit and think and actually think, be with yourself, not to sit down for 20 minutes and scroll or check emails or check texts or worry about this, that, and the other. Just time to be still. Like I said in the podcast, we're not human doings. We are human beings. But if all we do is do, we forget the being part. And stillness is a way we remember, you know, like, oh yeah, how do I just be? How do I be here now? 
when we get stuck in our head, which so much of stress is because of that feedback loop, it's usually anxiety related, stress related, worrying about something, constantly ruminating. That is the antithesis of presence. Because when you're truly present, you're truly with that one breath, or you're truly with that, those people that just make you feel alive and like time, you even forget it, it evaporates. There's no stress in that moment. But as soon as that thing goes away and you go back up to the head and you go back up to the anxiety in the mind, it comes back. So the more we practice this, the more we can find ourselves operating at a, at a default. Nobody's gonna be perfectly present all the time because your brain is designed to help you survive, not thrive. It's not really concerned with that. Your ego doesn't really exist in the present moment and your ego just wants to kind of rule the show. So of course it's going to pull you out. It's going to pull you into a regretful past or it's going to pull you into an anxious future, but that's going to rob you of this present moment now, the only moment that is. So really try to, you know, build some stillness time into your life. Community and connection. Be around good people. Be around people that make you feel good. Hug them, touch them, you know, kiss them. If it's your romantic partner, hold hands, like be connected to people. Your, your nervous system needs people. If you feel very lonely in life right now, start to seek out and find people. Play, uh, creative endeavors, learn a new instrument, sing, paint, join a pottery class, whatever kind of calls for you. Um, ask yourself what you used to do as a kid that you loved, that you've not done now because you're too busy being an adult. You might remember like, I used to absolutely love just shooting the basketball. And when was the last time you did that? Well, 10 years ago. I haven't shot a basketball in 10 years. Then just go find some time to go shoot the basketball, whatever it is. And don't make play serious because <laughs> we say go play and then people go play and it's so serious and they get themselves all worked up about it. You know, they, they bring it home with them. They curse themselves out because they missed the shot or whatever it is. So play is non-attachment to the outcome. You do it for the love of doing it. And like I said, what happens in the vagus stays in the vagus nerve. When we talk about vagus nerve stimulation, one of the best things that we can do is singing, humming. So if you like to play an instrument or you like to sing or you find yourself singing in the car a lot, that's kind of what you're doing. You're self, uh, self-soothing. Uh, I realized uh, that I whistle a lot. <laughs> Always walking around whistling. And what I'm doing is I'm talking to my vagus nerve. I'm trying to shift from human uh, doing into human being and relax. Humming, oming, singing, all of those things are a way to regulate through the vagus nerve, get into the parasympathetic. And last but not least, rest. Give yourself some permission to rest. I think that we feel guilty a lot of the times for not doing anything. I'd say we suffer in our culture from productivity dysmorphia, the need to constantly do more and the overwhelming sense that when we just sit down on the grass or lie in a hammock that there's a guilt there that we should be doing more shouldn't i be trying to build my business or shouldn't i be working on myself shouldn't i listen to a new podcast like so many people myself included struggle to even just go for a walk and not stack that with the audible or the podcast not need to make just something that could be rejuvenating and completely relaxing something that we turn into productive and self-growth. And again, that's the unhealthy obsession with health. There's nothing wrong with going for a walk and listening to a podcast. Some of you are probably listening to this podcast on a walk right now. But if you haven't taken a walk in years without, you know, speed churning through your podcast list, then maybe try that. Or maybe just try not doing the walk and lying on the grass for half an hour and seeing what that's like. And just give yourself permission to rest without the guilt that you constantly need to be doing and doing and doing. So I hope that helps you kind of understand a little bit deeper about stress or just put it back into the lens of your awareness. I think we all have our own unique relationship with stress. I just think that a lot of the times we get caught up in life running around and doing stuff. So there's some suggestions there. There's some challenges there. I hope there's a little more nuance into how stress actually shows up and this kind of villain in the case of hypocortisolemia and how this could be robbing you of the results that you really deserve. And often getting the results that you really deserve is not doing more. It's doing less but better. It's really being intentional. It's about trying to move from uh, fight or flight sympathetic land into rest and digest parasympathetic land and spending a little bit more time there because that's where you'll really find joy that's where you'll find healing that's where you'll find more truth in who you are as well 
So that's it for today, fam. We have no callers on the line today. So go spend this extra time decompressing, de-stressing, go do some singing or humming, go sign up for that new class, go rest, relax, and we will see you next week. Peace out, friends. Bye-bye. All right, friends. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We got a fresh new podcast for you every Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, consider liking, subscribing, reviewing, and rating us on your podcast platform. It helps us spread this message of Radical Health. We'll see you next week.